Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last talk of our of Physics Society this term. And today we have Dr. Harry Quick. He's a particle physicist, physicist based on uh, based at the University of Cambridge, but also uh, the LHCB at CERN. So more specifically, he works on the rare decay of UV, but D mesons. And besides being a researcher, he's also a brilliant science communicator. He has given a lot of talks uh, in places such as uh, the Royal Institution and also TED Talks. And here also curated Science Museum in London. And also he's the author of a popular science book for how to make an apple pie from scratch. Hope I got that right. Uh, <laughs> Oh, also you guys should check out his brilliant comedy on YouTube. Oh God, no, I really don't. <laughs> uh, so today he's here to talk about rare beauty, um, see new physics, sorry, <laughs> at the LSCB experiment. We are happy to have you, Harry. Thanks, thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, thanks for coming out on this wet evening as well. So I'm, I'm gonna talk to you a bit about my research and particularly something very interesting has been happening in high energy physics in the last few years and this is a very very like current story so this is research that's kind of still evolving in the moment so we're in quite an uncertain place so i'm going to try and give you a flavor of what exactly has been going on um in at the heart at the large hadron collider but in, in high energy physics a bit more broadly um so i'll just start with a bit of sort of well historic background so my involvement in particle physics started way back in the summer of 2007 when i was a summer student at cern so this was the point, this was before the LHC had switched on for the first time. And it was a really cool time to be at CERN because the machine was just being finished. So what you can see here are some photographs, well, a photograph of this, what's called the CMS experiment. It's one of the four big detectors at Large Hadron Collider. And it's really cool. You go to the surface building on the far side of the LHC ring, you see these massive slabs of detector ready to go underground. So there's a real sense of excitement and anticipation back then. And just to give you a sense of scale, these things are like 15 meters high. So, you know, sort of several stories, five stories high, really enormous objects. And this was the beginning, really. I spent the way it was a culmination of a journey that had begun in the 1970s. The first discussions about the Large Hadron Collider took place in 1976, which gives you a sense of the timescales involved in these sorts of projects. But anyway, I turned up when it was basically all finished. Here's me, aged 21, with rather inadvisable long hair. Um, anyway, so that was sort of the, just around the time the LHC switched on. So this is an aerial shot of CERN, um, uh, well, the area around CERN in Geneva. So this is the home of the Large Hadron Collider. In the background there, you can see uh, Mont Blanc and the Alps. That's Lake Geneva uh, there. And then this bit, this sort of greyish smudge is the city of Geneva. And then marked from the countryside in yellow is the route of the Large Hadron Collider. So as I'm sure you know, this is a gigantic particle accelerator. It's the biggest scientific instrument that's been ever been built by human beings. Um, by some measures, it's the biggest machine that's ever been built. It's 27 kilometers around. And what it does is really very simple and quite brutal. It takes protons, it whizzes them around a circle, accelerates them to 99.999999% uh, of the speed of light, and then they're smashed into each other at four points around the ring, CMS, LHCV, Alice, and Atlas, four big experiments, which then record what happens. And yeah, the reason we're doing this is ultimately to understand what are the elementary building blocks of the universe and what are the laws, what are the fundamental laws that govern their behavior? That's the really big picture. But I'll talk a bit about more specific questions that we're trying to ask, answer at this machine uh, later in the talk. But um, before I do that, I, I, this probably you're all physicists, this shouldn't really be, be necessary, but I'll give you a very, very quick tour of what we already know about the structure of matter. So if you ask someone 100 years ago, well, more than 100 years ago now, 126 years ago, what the universe was made from, they tell you that it's made from about 90 different atoms. So there were these elements, atoms were thought of as being fundamental there was one for every chemical element 90 different building blocks but at the start of the 20th century beginning actually here in cambridge in 1897 that was the first time the subatomic particles were discovered and over the first few years of the 20th century we get this familiar cartoon model of the atom with the nucleus in the center electrons going around the outside then a bit later uh, in the sort of late 19 teens into the 1930s people start to do experiments where they fire First of all, particles of radioactivity at atoms, then later accelerated particles. And the first time, actually, the first place where accelerated particles were used to disintegrate atoms was here again here in Cambridge at the Cambridge Laboratory. Um, and what people found was they could knock bits out of the nucleus. And these are, of course, protons and neutrons, which you're familiar with. 
Um, and then in the 1960s, uh, the next sort of stage of this process took place in California, a large accelerator called the Stanford Linear Accelerator, which was a three kilometer long electron gun, essentially, that accelerated electrons very close to the speed of light, fired them at atoms. And what they found was when you, when you watch the angles that the electrons are scattered off nuclei, they, you could actually resolve three, low, three points of charge inside protons and neutrons, which we call quarks. So there are two types of quark that make up ordinary matter, the up quark, and the down quark, the up quark has a plus two thirds charge, the down quark a minus one third charge. So two ups and a down is a proton, two downs and up is a neutron. So we have these, these particles form part of uh, this theory uh, of fundamental physics, which is really the closest we have at present to a genuine theory of everything. It's almost a theory of everything. In fact, the only thing it doesn't really describe is gravity. But beyond that, it's got everything that we've observed in the laboratory, at least, down. Um, we gave it a very impressive title. It's called the Standard Model, um, and it contains a whole load of particles. In particular, it contains the electron, the two quarks that make up everything around us, makes up you and me, this room, the Earth, the stars. And then there's also the electron neutrino, which is a you know an, an electrically neutral, almost massive particle that's produced in vast numbers. For example, in nuclear processes in the sun, there's trillions of them going through you every second, but you're blissfully unaware of it. And then for some reason that we don't really understand, these, so these four particles make up what we call the first generation of matter. That's the particles that, broadly speaking, make up the observable universe. But for reasons we do not understand, uh, this is what we discovered over the course of the 20th century, there are additional sets of particles. So there are two more columns in this table that are called the second and the third generations of matter. These particles were originally discovered in cosmic ray experiments, so looking at stuff that comes down from the heavens, but then later in colliders where they were created uh, in experiments. And in these next two columns, which are the second and the third generation, we basically have copies of the first generation with exactly the same properties, they're just heavier. So for example, the electron has a heavier partner called the muon, which is exactly the same as the electron in every way, except for that it's two, about 200 times heavier, Similarly, the up quark has a super heavy version called the top quark, which is the heaviest particle we've ever discovered, which weighs uh, almost uh, it's about 100,000 times heavier um, than, a, than, a, than a first generation quark. So the, there's this huge hierarchy and masses between the lightest particles and the heaviest. And we, we should say we do not understand why these three generations exist, nor do we understand why there are quarks and what we call leptons, the, the, the electron neutrino. So if you you can figure that out you you will definitely win a Nobel Prize and that's one of the questions actually we're interested in the large hadron collider we have this sort of suggested periodic table of elementary particles but we don't really know where they come from what we would like to find is some deeper symmetry some deeper principle that explains the origins of these things and then in addition to the matter particles you then have the particles that communicate the three fundamental forces in the standard model which are the electromagnetic interaction the weak force and the strong force so you have photons for electromagnetism, gluons for the strong force, because they stick quarks together inside hadrons. And then you've got the Z and W boson, which are the mediators of the weak interaction. So this was the, the picture of the standard model uh, that was confirmed, at least, up until the 3rd of July 2012. And the piece that was still missing on the 3rd of July 2012 was this, which is the Higgs boson, which is the, the final particle, the last missing piece of the standard model. And finding the Higgs was one of the key objectives of the Large Hadron Collider. There was a kind of a no-lose theorem with the LHC, which was that we knew when you got to the energies the LHC would be probing, you would definitely find the Higgs boson or something else would happen because basically the standard model doesn't work unless you have this new particle there. So we were, it was guaranteed to be an interesting, an, inter an interesting discovery coming out of this machine. But in a way, the Higgs was a kind of uh, a bit of unfinished business from the 20th century. It's part of uh, where well, it came out of electroweak theory, which is a key part of the standard model in the 1960s and 70s. It sort of been predicted almost half a century earlier. And in many ways, most where well, if you ask a lot of theorists, most would have, have bet quite a large amount of money that this thing was going to be found. In fact, I think um, Nima Arkani Hamid, actually, who's a very eminent theorist in the Institute of Advanced Study, actually bet a year's salary that the Higgs would be found. He was so sure. Uh, and I think the guy who then he made the bet with actually sort of like cheated on it and then refused to pay up. But actually, no, actually a year's salary in the UK is not so much, but in, the, in America, that's quite a lot. So, you know, that actually means something. Anyway, but, you know, as I said, so the Higgs is a bit of unfinished business, but there are many big questions that we know the standard model cannot address. And that was, that this is really the reason that people 
you know, working on the LHC, we were excited back in 2012, well, in the early part of the last decade, that we were going to get answers to some of the big unanswered questions in fundamental physics. So this is an image that illustrates one of them. This is a photograph of a cluster of galaxies uh, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And what you can see here um, is the effect known as gravitational lensing. So this is the bending of light by the fact that massive objects bend the fabric of space-time. So what you can see in this image, it may not be totally clear, but you can see, if you look carefully, these kind of smeary circular lines that kind of go around the center of this image. And what is essentially happening here is behind this, you've got this cluster of galaxies in the middle. Somewhere behind this cluster of galaxies is another galaxy. And as its, as its light travels towards us, it's bent by the curvature of space-time like a lens. So you end up essentially, if this was a perfect lens, a perfectly symmetrical lens, you get the same galaxy appearing in a circle smeared across the whole sky. And you're seeing this a kind of in a partial way. Now, from looking at images like this and looking at the amount of gravitational lensing you see, you can infer the amount of mass in this image. So essentially, you can weigh this cluster of galaxies in the center. Um, what astronomers find is if you do this and you weigh, you work out how much matter there is uh, causing this lensing, and then you compare it to the amount of stuff you can actually see with your telescope, so the, the visible matter, you find there's an enormous discrepancy, a sort of five-fold discrepancy. There appears to be much more mass in this image than you can actually see. And this is, of course, what we call dark matter. So we know now, uh, thanks to astronomy, that uh, the universe is actually mostly invisible. So this is a pie chart of what we think the universe is made from. 5% is atoms. So that's basically the stuff described by the standard model. That's you know all the particles we know about. Then there's 27% dark matter, and we have no idea what that is. And then there's 68% dark energy, which is, the, is a form of energy that we believe is driving the accelerating expansion of the universe. So the universe is basically dominated by these dark components. So what well, I said, the standard model is the closest we have to a theory of everything. Well, really, it's only a theory of 5% in reality. 95% of the universe is totally unknown. And you know, the large, one of the purposes of the Large Hadron Collider is to try to give us some information at least about the dark matter component. It's very unlikely to tell, anything, to tell us anything about dark energy, but maybe dark matter. That would be one of the, that is one of the big prizes that we're, we're trying to reach. Um, other reasons we know the standard model is wrong in some sense or incomplete is that uh, for every particle in the standard model, every matter particle, there is a mirror image called an antiparticle, which again has identical properties, just opposite charges. So the electron's antiparticle is a positron, which is exactly the same as the electron it has the same mass uh, and it's stable, but it has a positive instead of a negative charge. But in the standard model, Every time you create a particle, you also are forced to create a corresponding antiparticle. There's some sort of subtle corollary to that, but that's broadly true. And what that means is if you go back to the very earliest moments of the Big Bang, when matter and antimatter would have been created in vast quantities. So we're talking in the first millionth of a second after the Big Bang. You have a huge amount of energy in that initial primordial plasma. Particles and antiparticles are being created continuously. And what that what that, and what happens is essentially after about a millionth of a second, the universe expands to the extent that the temperature of the plasma drops and you no longer have enough energy to keep generating new particles and antiparticles. So what happens? Well, you have this event that Frank Close calls the great annihilation, where particles and antiparticles very rapidly meet up with each other. They annihilate each other. And what should have happened, according to the standard model, is you end up with a universe with nothing in it except a few photons whizzing through the infinite blackness. But of course, we know that the universe has loads of stuff in it. So the fact there is an observable universe is a big problem if you're a theoretical physicist, right? It's a rather inconvenient fact, really. Um, so again, we, in order to explain this, in order to find some mechanism that could have generated an imbalance between matter and antimatter, you need physics beyond the standard model. You need new particles, new forces that interfered with this process in the very earliest moments of the Big Bang and created enough of an imbalance for there to be enough matter left over to create the observable universe. Interestingly, we're only talking about tiny imbalance. So you can actually estimate the uh, amount of matter and antimatter generated in the beginning of the universe. And what's left over is about one ten billionth of the total. So we're really a tiny, tiny sort of wobble on the total amount of matter and antimatter at the beginning. But in the standard model, that wobble doesn't exist. There's it's essentially, it's, there's this perfect balance between the two. So standard, standard model doesn't explain 95% of the universe. It also says we shouldn't exist. Those are two pretty big problems. Um, a final one I'll talk about, there are, there are others, but uh, another one I'll talk about is to do with actually this Higgs boson itself. So um, 
the, the Higgs boson, the, the reason it's actually interesting, it's the Higgs boson is a new particle, but what it actually tells us is something more fundamental. The fact that we have now seen the Higgs boson at the Large Hadron Collider tells us that something exists in the universe called the Higgs field. And the Higgs field is a quantum field uh, that is responsible for giving mass to the other elementary particles. So to in particular, the W and the Z bosons in the weak force and the matter particles, the electron, muon, tau, and the quarks, possibly also the neutrinos, but we're not sure about that just yet. So what the Higgs boson really is essentially, and actually this is true of all particles, is that it's a ripple, it's a vibration, a quantum excitation in this Higgs field, which is all around us. It's invisible, but it's, you know, it fills the whole universe. And the Higgs field is actually unique amongst all of the known fields in nature. So if you, if you imagine going to a very distant part of the universe, putting a box around it and sucking out all of the stray atoms, all the stray particles, even the neutrinos, if you can manage it, it would have to be a very thick box, I suppose. But, you know, so you've got an actual genuine vacuum. And then you, if you could, let's say, measure, say, the strength of the electromagnetic field in that box, what you would get is a value that is effectively zero with a small quantum jitter on top of it, but basically zero. And that's true for all of the other fields in the standard model. The only field this is not true for is the Higgs. So the Higgs field actually has a non-zero vacuum expectation value uh, throughout the entire universe. So it's the sort of essential amount of energy essentially stored in the Higgs field. And it's this non-zero value that gives mass to the particles in nature. You can, in a sort of a, a bad analogy, it's often described the Higgs field is a bit like a kind of gloopy, treacly fluid. You can think of it that way. And the sort of energy essentially tells you how gloopy it is. So that, that, as you imagine an electron, say, which originally without the Higgs field would be massless, plowing through this thick kind of molasses. And that process effectively sort of imbues the property of mass to, into the electron. But without the Higgs field, electrons, quarks, the W and the Z wouldn't have mass at all. So that's why the Higgs boson is exciting. It tells about the origin of mass of, of, of the elementary particles. But there is a bit of a problem with this idea. And it uh, is essentially this. So if you do a sort of a, a rough calculation using the standard model and what we know about quantum field theory, you set, and you try to figure out what are the likely values of the Higgs field, you get two answers, essentially. One answer is that the Higgs field gets essentially switched on all the way. So it ends up with a vacuum expectation value that gets pushed all the way up to the Planck scale. So the highest energy scale we can reasonably picture. This is the scale where quantum gravity becomes important and we know that quantum field theory must break down at that energy. So this is an enormous vacuum expectation value of 10 billion billion giga electron volts. Now, this, if this were the case, uh, this would be very, very bad because if the Higgs field was this strong, every elementary particle would become so massive that it would collapse into a black hole. And then the entire universe would be filled with black holes and not very much else. So clearly we don't live in this scenario. There is another option. Um, the other option is that the Higgs field gets pushed out all the way to zero um, and you end up with no energy stored in the Higgs field. But this is also bad if you like existing because what this means is the elementary particles become massless. And if say electrons, for example, are massless, they don't bind to atoms and you don't have any structure in the universe. So the universe would basically be filled with a kind of haze of light particles zipping around. Now, interestingly, actually, this universe, you would still have protons and neutrons because most of their mass doesn't come from the Higgs field. It comes from the, the binding of the strong interaction. So you'd have protons and neutrons, uh, but you wouldn't have atoms. So that would be pretty bad. So basically, we have these two scenarios, both of which are lethal, uh, if, if you want to exist. Um, but we now know that now that the Higgs has been discovered, we now calculate the vacuum expectation value and you get this number of 246 giga electron volts, which is neither zero, but nor is it 10 billion billion. And it's rather suspicious, actually, because it turns out if you change this value, even by a little bit, you very quickly find yourself living in a universe, well, where you can't live, essentially. So it looks like the, the value, the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field has been very finely tuned to just the right value in order to allow us to exist. So this is a, you know, is really quite fishy. Um, to give you an analogy, it, it's sort of a bit like finding, you know, a, the standard model, there are about 25-ish fundamental constants that you have to put into the standard model. And it's essentially equivalent to saying, well, you know, if you have these 25 numbers and you can alter their values, there's, there's the chance of aligning all these numbers in just the right way is vanishingly small. I forget the exact figure, but it's, you know, I think it's, it's parts in 10 to the 16, something like that. 
So, you know, if there were 10 to the 16 ways of arranging these numbers, only one of them would give you a Higgs field consistent with us existing. This is what we call a fine tuning problem or the hierarchy problem um, in the standard model. And it's a problem that actually has motivated a lot of theoretical developments uh, in the last few decades. Now, the most popular solution to this problem is called supersymmetry. So supersymmetry is a sort of extension of the standard model where you add an additional new type of symmetry to nature. And this is a symmetry between fermions, so matter particles with spin one half or half integer spin, and bosons, uh, force particles with integer spin. So in supersymmetry, every particle in the standard model gets a super version called a sparticle. Um, they all have really stupid names. So uh, the selectron, or the electron, I should say, gets a super partner, which is a sort of force part the particle equivalent called the selectron. Uh, the up quark gets a super version called the sub squark. Uh, my least favorite, I think, is the strange squark. Um, they all, yeah, I'm kind of glad we haven't found them, to be honest. Uh, now, this all sounds a bit silly. The, the reason this theory was very well motivated and exciting, it actually solved several problems at the same time. One of them is that the, the light, in many supersymmetric theories, the lightest superparticle is, sta is, is stable and it's electrically neutral. So it's massive, it's stable, and it's electrically neutral, which is exactly what you want for dark matter. So supersymmetry explained potentially what dark matter was. It also, in some scenarios, gave you a process which could create more matter than antimatter in the early universe, a process called baryogenesis. Um, but most importantly, what it did was it stabilized the Higgs field. So the reason that the Higgs field gets driven to these extreme values is essentially due to quantum fluctuations. So there are these, there are about there are about 16 other fields in the standard model. And because of quantum uncertainty, they're all sort of jittering around. And it's these kind of jitters that interact with the Higgs field and either drive it up to massive values or down to very small values. These super particles essentially add in a set of jitters in the opposite direction and stop it getting not one way or the other and stabilize it at the electroweak scale. So the scale of the W and the Z bosons and the Higgs, which is where we found it. So these are all the reasons to really love supersymmetry. It was a very popular idea. People were a lot of people were very confident that it would be found. There were even people saying that when we turned on the Large Hadron Collider, there would be so many superparticles we wouldn't be able to cope with them. They'd be kind of flooding our detectors, and we'd have to, you know, kind of pre-scale all our trigger lines and things. But anyway, that was that. That was the sort of state of affairs back in you know 2010 when the LHC started colliding at high energy for the first time. So I'll say a little bit more about this machine um, before we get into what it's found. So. What you can see, uh, again, this is that same photograph, to give you a bit of a bit more sense of the geography. So over here, well, here's actually what you can see there. This is at the Geneva Airport runway. And then just here is the CERN, the main CERN laboratory. So this is, um, so if you've ever been to CERN, it's sort of the size of a small town. Uh, it's several miles long, about 2,000, but it's a town populated exclusively by, by physicists. You can kind of imagine what that must be like. Um, but it's got a lot of things towns normally have. It's got, you know, it's got uh, sort of shops, it's got, uh, restaurants, it's got a post office, it's got a bank, that, but also, uh, you know, lots of experimental facilities and rather grotty, grotty offices. And um, one of the funny things about going to CERN is when I first arrived there, and I think a lot of people suffer from this, is this overwhelming sense of disappointment, because when you, you think it's going to be this kind of gleaming futuristic laboratory, but when you get there, it looks a bit like a shabby 1950s university campus. Um, but, but all the sort of magic stuff is really underground. But what is happening essentially, somewhere over here at CERN, there is a bottle of hydrogen gas, an ordinary industrial bottle. The gas is taken out, it's ionized with a high voltage electric field. The uh, hydrogen molecules are, are sort of separated into protons and electrons. And then the protons are sent through a series of accelerators. There's a linear accelerator that starts the whole thing off that's about 30 meters long. And then the, they're passed through a series of rings increase, of increasing size. So eventually they end up in something called the super proton synchrotron. It's a seven kilometer circumference ring, which back in the 80s was the world's most powerful particle accelerator. It was where the W and the Z bosons were discovered in 1984. Um, they, 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 now it's just a slipway to the Large Hadron Collider. Then put into this machine, they go around the ring, two counter rotating beams. And over here, this little point here, this is the actual bit of, that does the accelerating. So there's a 30 meter stretch of the collider that contains a series of cavities, or radio frequency cavities with a very fast oscillating two million volt electric field. And the way that it basically works is as a proton approaches, enters the box, the polarity of the field is set such that it sees an attractive potential. 
So it's pulled into the middle of the cavity. And then as it crosses the center, it flips to repulsive and it gets pushed out. So by this process, every time it goes through one of these cavities, it gets a little kick in energy and it has accelerated. So it go, actually goes into um, the ring at 450 giga electron volts. And it's eventually accelerated up to around seven tera electron volts. So the equivalent of seven trillion volts. Um, and that process takes about half an hour. When they're going at full speed, the protons are orbiting the ring 11,000 times every second. So it's you know, pretty nippy. Uh, and then once you've got stable beams, once they're up at full energy, the engineers in the control center then bring the two beams into collision. So they're crossed over, adjusted using magnets, essentially, and you start to get collisions. So if you go down to the tunnel, this is what you see, um, a very, very, very long blue tube curving away into the distance. So this is what most of the, uh, the Large Hadron Collider is made from. So what you can see here is a cryostat uh, containing superconducting magnets. So as I said, only 30 meters of the machine actually does the accelerating. The rest of it is just there to get the particles back around again so they can be accelerated again. That's all it's there for. And this is done using very, very powerful magnets because you've got these particles going incredibly quickly. You need a very strong force to bend them around this ring. And these magnets, because they're superconductors, they use a superconductor called niobium uh, titanium that only works at about minus 271 degrees Celsius. So the whole machine is chilled using liquid nitrogen and then liquid helium, which is pumped intravenously through the magnet coils to keep them cold. Um, so it's actually the LHC is the largest cryogenic facility in the world. Uh, and that's where most of the power goes actually since the cryogenics. But just to give you a sense of the engineering challenges involved, I mean, one of the amazing facts about this thing, I mean, you all know this, I guess, you know, of course you do. But what happens when you cool down a piece of metal? Come on, it yes, thank you, yes, it contracts. So what you are doing here is cooling down a 27 kilometer piece of metal. And what happens then is it shrinks by 30 meters in length. So the whole machine has to be able to flex and contract and expand. So you know, you're cooling this thing down by two, well, 300 degrees more or less from room temperature down to its operating temperature. And the fact it can do that and remain you know, micron aligned and not break itself, I think is you know, extraordinary. Anyway. That's the, that's the LHC. And then at four points around the ring, this tunnel, which is about the size of a sort of subway tunnel, opens up into a much bigger subterranean space. So here you can see one of these cathedral sized caverns. This is again, the pitch, this, this is CMS. This, that, that's the thing I showed you at the beginning that I was standing next to as a 21 year old. This is it all now assembled underground. Now to give you a sense of scale, there's a, a guy in a hard hat. So this is a really enormous machine. And what it basically is, is a gigantic three-dimensional digital camera. It's in barrel shape. So what you're seeing here is one end of the barrel where the end cap has been pulled away to reveal the inner workings a bit. So this here you can see the LHC beam pipe coming in. So particles come in from one direction here, they come into the other side, they collide in the middle of this barrel, which is made of concentric rings of detector technology that allow you to then reconstruct the trajectories of the particles. So CMS, I should say, CMS stands for Compact Muon Solenoid Experiment. I always thought it's a strange use of the word compact, something that is 15 meters high and weighs 14,000 tons. You could actually make two Eiffel Towers out of the iron in this experiment. So it's, you know, it's massive and very heavy. Um, and this is what happens when two protons collide. So this is uh, an event display of a collision that took place in June 2011. So what you can see here are two protons having a very bad day. Um, they've been hanging around. They've probably created at the very first moments of the Big Bang. They've been hanging around minding their own business for billions of years until some nasty physicists got their hands on them, decided they wanted to do an experiment. So what you can see here, partly what you can see is what's inside a proton. Um, so you'll see the quarks, the gluons that are in the proton being sprayed out when they collide. But actually, most of what you're seeing here are new particles that don't normally exist. So the reason you do this acceleration is because you want to make forms of matter that do not normally exist in the universe. So in some ways, the LHC is the opposite of a nuclear weapon. It turns a very, very large amount of energy into a very small amount of new matter, which then usually only lives for a tiny fraction of a second before it decays. And then you get a spray of particles that come out from the collision point. So the detector's job is to reconstruct these collisions. And these sort of collisions take place 40 million times every second inside the experiments. And that happens for about nine months of the year. So you get a sense, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So you can get a sense of the, the amount of data that's generated. In fact, if you were to try to record all of the data that's produced by the experiments, it would, I think, 
Now, this this was this was a fact that was true a few years ago. It's probably slightly wrong now, but it, it within about a year, the LHC would create more information than than the human race has created its entire history, including every book and telephone conversation and email and so on. So, it's a totally unmanageable amount of data. So what happens in practice is that there are these algorithms called triggers that look at each collision in real time and try to figure out whether it's seen something interesting. Because most of the time when you have a collision, what you get are standard model particles, quarks and leptons coming out. And it's only in a very generally a quite small fraction where there's something interesting that's happened, like you've made a Higgs boson, or maybe if you're lucky, a part of the particle of dark matter. So this um, this is a photograph from the twelfth, sorry, the fourth of July two thousand and twelve, which was became known at CERN as CERN as a Higgs Dependence Day, being the fourth of July. And this is as excited as you're ever going to see particle physicists getting. This was a, the seminar where the discovery of the Higgs boson was announced. And actually, the the two white haired gentlemen you can see standing taking the applause. Uh, one on the one on the right is Lynn Evans, who is a Welsh phys accelerator physicist who project managed the LHC. Um, for, for over a decade. Um, you, you walk into his office, there's a mother of all Gantt charts on his wall. Um, and then next to him is Crystal Ellen Smith, who was the Director General of CERN, who was responsible in the 90s for sort of getting the funding together from various governments to build this thing. Uh, but also in the audience, and I don't think you can see him, maybe, maybe that's him, that might just be him just there, it was Peter Higgs himself. So Higgs was one of five theorists who came up with the idea of the Higgs mechanism uh, in the 1960s. It's quite a touching moment because there's this moment you know, lots of excitement and applause, and you saw Higgs wiping away a tear. And he later said, you know, he was by this point in his 80s, and the work he did, I think, was when he was in his early 30s. And he said, he, you know, he never really anticipated he wouldn't live long enough to see this moment. So it was a very, a very exciting day. Um, but then, uh, since then, so we, we found the Higgs, so I say we, Atlas and CMS found the Higgs, I was not involved. Um, I went to try and take credit for that. And uh, but then the sort of hope was right. That's that's the standard model done. We've finished the 20th century. Time to move on to the 21st century and try and find new particles, you know, supersymmetry or whatever else might be hiding out there. But quite quickly, even before the Higgs was discovered, actually, it was becoming clear that the sort of most vanilla forms or the most popular forms of supersymmetry were not being found. So this was a story from the BBC. Uh, from a result actually from LHCB, where we were indirectly probing the supersymmetric theories by looking at beauty quark decays. And it that we basically, this, this decay was supposed to give us strong evidence for supersymmetry if it was there, but it was very, very standard model-like. So no sign of supersymmetry, but that's fine, it's still time. This is another story from 2015, LHC, LHC keeps bruising, difficult to kill supersymmetry, popular physics theory running out of hiding places. So you get the idea. Things were not looking very good for supersymmetry or indeed for any new physics. So by the middle of the last decade, we got to this position after the first run of the LHC, which ended at the end of uh, 2012, um, that there was no sign of new particles. All we'd done, all we'd managed to do was find the Higgs boson, which is, well, I say all, that's a big achievement, found the Higgs boson, that's good, but then essentially reconfirmed all the predictions of the standard model. Um, and uh, there was this brief moment in uh, 2015 uh, where actually there was a lot of excitement, this little bump appeared in a mass spectrum. So the way you generally look for new particles, a uh, collider, is you, you plot the invariant mass of some pairs of particles. In this case, it was two high-energy gamma rays, so two high-energy photons. And there was a graph produced where you saw this kind of background spectrum, and on top of it was a little wiggle. And it was only about a sort of two, three sigma wiggle, so not particularly significant. But nonetheless, Atlas and CMS, these two big experiments, both saw this wiggle. And this came out just in December 2015 on about the 17th of December, I think it was. And by Christmas, there were 400 papers written by theorists trying to explain what this tiny bump in a graph was. Uh, so this was very exciting. People thought, well, maybe this is the first sign of a superparticle. But then when more data was added in, in summer of 2016, the, the bump disappeared. It turned out it was just a statistical fluctuation. So th th this is sort of, it was a bit of a tale of woe, really. Quite disappointing if you were hoping to find signs of new physics. Now, I'll get on to the stuff, sort of the meat of the talk now. So this is, this is true, and we still haven't found any signs of beyond the standard model physics. But in the last few years, there have been some very intriguing results that have come predominantly out of the experiment I work on, which is LHCB. So this is um, a photograph of LHCB, uh, the experiment underground. It's not quite as pretty as CMS, it's a bit like a multicolored toe scrap, but it's, it's a very cool experiment. And what LHCB uh, does, it, it plays a rather different game uh, to Atlas and CMS, which are the big general purpose detectors. In, in, broadly speaking, what those experiments do are look, looking for 
direct signs of new particles being created. But what we do at LHCB is a bit different. So to understand that, first of all, this is a little cartoon of you know, the relationship between particles and quantum fields. So in quantum field theory, which is the standard model is a quantum field theory, all the elementary particles, in some sense, they're not really elementary. They're not fundamental. They're made of something else. And the things they're made of are quantum fields. So the electron is a little quantum excitation of an underlying quantum field called the electron field. Photons are excitations of the electromagnetic field. Quarks are excitations of the quark field. So you have 17 fields in the standard model, and each particle is a little disturbance. This is the, a cartoon by David Tong, who's a, a professor at the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. The representing, this is particle physics in action. There's two particles colliding, but all they are really are some distortions in this underlying quantum field fabric. So that means that even when there are no particles in a quantum field, the field is still there. So the field is ever present. And this kind of is another way of thinking about what's happening in a collider. So as I said, Atlas and CMS are broadly looking for new particles being created. So what's actually happening there? Well, generally, you've got, so you have your two protons, proton one and proton two, carrying energy E each, and they're smacked into each other. And one way of thinking about what happens when they collide is that they are essentially hitting the vacuum. They are whacking the vacuum and seeing if they can make a quantum field resonate, essentially. So when you create a new particle, what you're essentially doing is exciting a quantum field, which then shows up as a new particle. So when the Higgs was discovered, what was essentially happening at the LHC is two protons smack into each other. They hit the Higgs field like a drum. The Higgs field vibrates. That appears briefly as this new particle, which then decays. So this is a very good way of discovering new particles, but it has a limitation, which is that you can only make particles which you have enough energy to make. So if you have a particle of mass m, the largest m can be is 2e over c squared. If it's bigger than that, you won't be able to create it, essentially. So there's a limit. The LHC collides at about 14 tera electron volts in energy. So that's an upper limit of the weight of a particle that you might be able to create. In practice, actually, you don't get 14 TeV because you're not colliding with fundamental particles. You're colliding quarks and gluons, which only carry a fraction of the energy of the proton. But so in practice, you're only getting up to a few tera electron volts. Um, so this is the limitation of direct searches. There's another way to do this kind of thing, which is indirect. So let's imagine you have some particle. It's just a standard model particle represented by this green blob. And it's an unstable particle, and it decays. So let's say it decays into these three other particles. Now, the way this happens, broadly speaking, in the standard model is through the forces in the standard model, usually particularly the weak interaction. So the weak interaction is the only interaction that can transform one elementary particle into another, into a different type. So you have this process mediated by the standard model forces. And what you can do is often with these sorts of processes, you can actually do a very precise prediction. So you can predict how often, for example, a particular decay should happen based on the known forces. But let us imagine that there is another, a new quantum field, say a new force that we haven't seen before. Well, okay, if that field, we may not be able to create the particle associated with that field, maybe it's too heavy, but nonetheless, the field is still there. And a certain amount of energy in this decay can leak through that field from the initial state into the final state. So what it sort of provides an additional route effectively for this decay to happen. And that can subtly alter how often uh, the decay may happen or alter other properties of the decay. A good example of this is beta decay. So ordinary beta decay discovered in 1895. We know that beta decay involves a field called the W boson field. Now, beta decay is when a neutron turns into a proton and gives off an electron and neutrino. The mass scale involved is about, well, the mass difference between a proton and a neutron is only a few MeV, okay? It's not, it's not very big. But the mass of the W boson, the particle of the weak field, is 80 GeV. So it's you know many orders of magnitude heavier than the scale of the decay. So, but then nonetheless, this weak field is still there, and that's what allows beta decay to happen, even though the particle is far too heavy to actually be created directly in that decay. So it's exactly the same idea. In some ways, you know, beta decay, uh, when Becquerel discovered it, was evidence for the existence of the W boson, but obviously no one knew that at the time. So the, the game you essentially play is you look for some decay, ideally a decay where you really understand the standard model very well and you can make a precise prediction. You make a precise measurement and you compare the prediction and the measurement. And if you see a difference, that can give you indirect evidence for a new force, for example. 
So what we do at LHCB is the, the B stands for beauty, which is one of the six quarks. It's the, the fifth heaviest of the quarks. It's the very heavy version of the down quark. Usually higher, the B quark referred to as the bottom quark. That's because back when the top and the bottom quark were discovered, there was a sort of, com not competition exactly, but a disagreement about what to call them. So one group of people wanted to call them truth and beauty, rather poetic. Uh, but in the end, physicists went for more prosaic top and bottom. Uh, but uh, LHCB would rather be known as beauty physicists than bottom physicists, so it's beauty for us. Um, now, the reason these things are very interesting is because, one, they are heavy. And because they're heavy, that means they tend to interact more strongly with heavy fields, i.e. fields with large particle masses. So they tend to be more coupled to, say, exotic new physics, if there is exotic new physics out there. They're also uh, relatively stable, so they, they're not stable perfectly, but they will live for about one and a half trillionths of a second after you create them, which may not sound very long, but in particle terms, that's a long time. Um, so the Higgs only lives for about 10 to the minus 25 seconds. So, you know, it's orders of many orders of magnitude shorter. So this thing actually lives long enough that if you create a beauty quark, it will fly in your detector for a centimeter or two before it decays. And it can also decay in a very, has a very rich set of decay. It can decay because it's relatively heavy, it can decay to most of the other standard model particles. So you have a huge range of different decay processes that you can study. And by doing these studies, you can then eke out evidence for hidden forces, hidden particles that you've not seen before. They're also very conveniently made in huge quantities. So billions and billions and billions of them at a collider every year. So here's a little image from LHCB. This is um, a typical collision from 2015. Uh, so LHCB is rather different to the other experiments. It's not barrel shaped, it's sort of pyramidal shaped, like a pyramid lying on its side. So the collisions actually happen at the edge of the detector over here in what's called the vertex locator. So this is where the collisions happen. And then the detector is kind of arrayed along the beam line in this kind of cone. And the reason it's shaped like that is because beauty quarks tend to be created close to the beam line. So they tend to fly along the beam line, whereas heavier things like the Higgs tends to be produced in a transverse direction which is why Alice and CMS have this barrel of geometry. So anyway, the beauty quarks will be created. They fly, as I said, a centimeter or two. They won't get very far, and then they will decay. And then the particles they come, that come out go flying through the rest of the experiment. And the job is then to reconstruct all these tracks and try and figure out if you actually had a beauty quark being created in your collision. So I'm not going to get on to the actual, the, the sort of meat of the talk, I suppose. So what we've been doing in the last few years at LHCB in particular, and this is an area that I work on, is in decays that are known as flavor changing neutral currents. It's a bit of a mouthful, but this is an example of one. So one way a beauty quark can decay is it can convert into a strange quark and two leptons, in this case, an electron and a positron. Now, this is a very rare process in the standard model, and this is the reason. So the W boson, which is the only particle that can change one type of particle into another, is electrically charged. It has a charge of, has a unit charge of either plus one or minus one. And that means when a quark decays into a lighter quark, it usually turns into the opposite type in the sense it turns from a down type quark into an up type quark or an up type quark into a down type quark. So actually the beauty quark, most, beauty, most of the time, the beauty quark will turn into a charm quark, which is, which is a positively charged quark as opposed to a strange quark, which has the same charge as the bottom quark. So the only way for this process to happen in the standard model is through some complicated set of interactions involving multiple W bosons and Z bosons and photons and other things. And because it's complicated and involves lots of fields at the same time, its amplitude tends to be low. So these decays only happen about one in a million times. So for every beauty quark we make only, sorry, every million beauty quarks we make, only one of them will decay in this way on average. And because it's very rare, that means that if you say have a contribution from a new force, which might be very, very small, this contribution could be very subtle because the force path could be very heavy, you have a good chance of actually seeing it altering the rate of the decay because the decay in the standard model is so rare. Um, so for example, if there exists a, uh, a particle with, a, with no electric charge that can change the flavor of the quark, that could significantly alter this decay, for example. So, the, the game that was being played at LHCB was to do this. So you measure this decay, beta S E E, and then you compare it to another decay, beta S nu mu. So essentially the same process, but instead of radiating uh, an electron-positron pair, you give off a muon-antimuon pair. 
Now, I said earlier in the talk that muons are carbon copies of electrons. They're identical. The only difference is they have 200 times heavier and they're unstable because of the fact they're heavier. But otherwise, they're exactly the same. And crucially, the forces in the standard model interact with electrons and muons at exactly the same rate. So the W boson couples to electrons and muons exactly the same, the Z and the photon and so on. That means if you compare the rate of these two processes, they should happen at exactly the same rate. And so by measuring, by measuring a ratio of the occurrence of these two, you can test something called lepton universality, this principle of the standard model that all of the charged leptons interact with the forces with the same strength. Now, what was found essentially, so if you, if you calculate this ratio, which we refer to as R, then this ratio in the standard model is one to a very high level of precision. There's a small uncertainty that comes from some QED effect, but basically there are some small effects because the electron is lighter than the muon. You get some phase space effects effectively, but otherwise they're exactly the same. But over the last, over a period of years, starting in 2014, the first measurement of this sort of ratio came out at 0.75 with an uncertainty of about 0.1. So what we call about two and a bit sigma. So two and a bit uncertainties away from one. Now, this isn't anything to get particularly excited about because so in, in particle physics, we have this rather arbitrary set of thresholds for when we start to get interested in something. So one sigma, that means your, you know, your, your measurement agrees with your theory within an uncertainty. That's not very interesting. Two sigma, well, you know, that, there's a decent chance of that happening just by random statistical fluctuations. When you get to three sigma, the probability of, of a, an experimental measurement fluctuating just because of statistics by three sigma is only about one in a thousand. So you're starting to get to a place where it starts to look interesting. That's for, for completely arbitrary reasons. Three sigma is regarded as evidence in particle physics. So this is where we say, okay, maybe there's something interesting going on. Now, the reason you have these, now three sigma, if you're a medical trial, that would be, you know, absolutely rock solid evidence. But in particle physics, it's just like, nah, maybe it's interesting. Um, and the reason for that is because at the LHC, we make many, many measurements. So I, I forget the exact number, but I think the LHC experiment may have published there over a thousand papers now. And that means you do a thousand measurements. You expect just by dumb luck that at least one of them will be over three sigma away from the standard model. So that's why the actual threshold for discovery is five sigma. So when you get to five uncertainties away, the chances of that being a statistical fluke is about one in three, uh, one in 3.5 million. We don't do millions of measurements. So at that point, you go, yeah, okay, there's something interesting going on. So two and a bit sigma, yeah, interesting, not that exciting. But then another measurement in 2017 using a related set of decays, based on the same underlying physical process, but different companion corpse, gave 0 0.69 plus or minus 0 0.11. So this is right on the edge of three sigma. And you have two independent measurements that both are showing the same thing. Basically, the, the muon decay is happening less often than the electron decay. Then in 2019, another measurement, essentially this one was an update of the first measurement, same particle decay. The number moved a bit towards one, so it came out about 0.85, but with a smaller uncertainty again, still just shy of three sigma. So it's getting quite, you know, you have two different measurements, well, three different measurements all saying the same thing. And then in 2021, in March, this, uh, that final measurement was updated again with more data. And this time it stayed exactly where it was. The uncertainty shrank and it crossed this three sigma threshold and everyone went bananas. So um, everyone got very excited because you now say this is evidence, very exciting. And the, as I said, the chances of this uh, being a statistical fluke at this point is about one in a thousand. So it's the same chance as tossing, pick up a coin, toss it 10 times, getting 10 heads in a row. It's roughly the same probability as that. And if you picked up a coin and toss it 10 times and got 10 heads in a row, you probably think there was something up with the coin, I imagine. So people are starting to get interested at this point. And actually, this gets out rare occurrence where physics gets into the media. So, you know, the BBC and the Guardian reported on this. Machine finds tantalizing hints of new physics. CERN hints at new force of nature. So this is really quite interesting. Uh, it was a very exciting day uh, back on the 23rd of March, 2021. Real sense of optimism. And the reason that it was also causing a big stir in the physics world was this: these weren't the only anomalies that we had found. So um, looking at these same processes, these flavor change neutral current processes, measuring in this case, this, these are just the muon decays now. And what these graphs are showing is something called the branching ratio or the differential branching ratio. So this is basically how often does the decay happen in essence um, as a function of something called Q squared. Q squared is the invariant mass of the dimuon pair. So taking their four vectors and again, squaring them basically. And what you can see, the, the, don't worry about details of these plots too much, but the, the data points of these crosses 
and the theoretical prediction from the standard model are these bands. And you can see, particularly at this low Q squared region, below about six, there's this tendency for the data points to undershoot the theory. And these are three different particle decays, so different B mesons, basically, but the same fundamental process, which is B to S and U. So you have these three different measurements. Now, the reason that these, these have actually been seen for many years, the reason they haven't excited people terribly much is because these, the theoretical predictions themselves are rather uncertain here. To actually calculate these differential branch interactions is very difficult. You have to take into account what are called hadronic effects. So stuff from quantum chromodynamics, which is the theory of quarks and gluons, which is very, very difficult to calculate. So there was a chance, there was a good chance that actually the theory prediction wasn't very solid. And that's why these weren't taken terribly seriously. But what's interesting is they line up with the ratios because you see this deficit in the ratio of muons to electrons. Here you're seeing a shortfall again of the muon decays compared to your standard model prediction. More interesting were, also, were angular observables. So another thing you can do in these decays is you have your beauty quark, it decays into a strange quark and two muons. You can measure the angles that these particles are produced at. And the standard model makes quite precise predictions for the angular distributions of these three particles. Right? What direction should they go in, basically, compared to the original particle? And again, uh, in, in two different decays, LHCB, the, this, this is an angular observable called P5 prime. It's, don't worry what it means, but it's basically to do with the angles of the particles. And what you can see here, P5 prime from two different decays, again, at low Q squared, there's this tendency for the points to drift away from the theory. Again, the theory is in the band and the points of the, the data. And then here's another observable called AFB. That again, doesn't really matter what it is, but the point is the points don't line up with the theory prediction. Now, this is more interesting because in the angular observables, the theory is better understood. So these quantum QCD effects don't have such a big part to play. Um, and these are two different decays. And both of these measurements are about three sigma from the standard model. Now, what, what theorists are very excited is that you can actually uh, oh, sorry, I should finish one other thing. So I said there, there are also a bunch of other ratios. So here are all the ratios that we measured at LHCB. Uh, I measured two of them, which this one and, and this one with the student. Um, so you can see here's the standard model at one. Again, all of these data points falling to the left from you know, a bunch of independent measurements, different people, different data sets. So it's quite interesting. You can see the significances. Some of them are not very significant, one sigma, two, two and a bit sigma, uh, but then three sigma down here. This is the one that got everyone very excited. So one of the reasons this was exciting is that theorists found it possible to explain all of these anomalies at the same time by adding generally a new particle to the standard model. And that is not obvious. It's not obvious you should be able to explain three different sets of measurements with a simple adjustment of the standard model. So what this, this plot is probably going to mean almost nothing to you, but these two numbers, these are two parameters called C10 and C9. They're what are called Wilson coefficient for any experts in the room. But the point, the important thing is that these uh, coefficients have a value of zero in the standard model. So there's that, the standard model is here at the origin. And these bands are the constraints from the different measurements. And so you have all these different measurements that give you, some of them give you this, you know, uh, the, the ratios that gave you this kind of bluish oblong thingy. Uh, some of them give you this band, others give you circles. And all these measurements sort of point to a value around here. They line up with each other, they all cross over. And it's not obvious that that should happen. And actually, if you combine all of the, if you combine all of these measurements together and calculated the difference with the standard model, you've got something that's way over five sigma. So five, six, seven sigma, depending on what assumptions you make. So in some sense, people said, well, we've already discovered new physics at this point. Um, and the popular, the two popular ideas, the two main ideas that explain these effects are something called a Z prime. So this is essentially a fifth force particle, which is very like the Z boson electrically neutral, but it's able to change quarks flavors directly. So here you can see it's turning a bottom quark into a strange quark directly in this Feynman diagram. Then if Feynman diagrams mean anything to everyone in the room, I guess if you're in third year, they do. Um, another possibility, even more exciting, is something called a lepto quark, which is again, uh, can either be a scalar or a vector boson that is able to directly convert quarks into leptons. Now this is not possible in the standard model. The reason these models are particularly interesting is because they um, actually fell out of a, a new type of uh, you probably heard of grand unified theories. These are theories that were popular in the 80s that tried to unify the strong interaction with the electroweak interaction. They never really went anywhere because they predicted protons, proton decay, which wasn't found. And they also generally the particles associated with them had absolutely enormous masses. 
And these anomalies have encouraged theorists to re-examine some of the ideas in ground unified theories. And they discovered it's actually possible to reformulate them in a different way, where you end up with low mass particles. So leptoquarks at the TeV scale rather than at the grand unified scale, which is many orders of magnitude higher. Um, so if this was right, what it could be telling us is actually some kind of unification, not of the strong force and the weak force, but actually between the quarks and the leptons. So it would be explaining this big puzzle of why do we have quarks and leptons and potentially why do we have three generations of matter? So a much more complete description of the ingredients of nature, which would be hugely exciting. Now, there is a sting. This is so, as I said, this was a very, very exciting time, particularly 2021, but there is a sting in the tail, unfortunately. So uh, there was another measurement ongoing uh, when this, this March 21 anomaly was measured by a different team looking at uh, essentially the same data again, but with some additional decays included. And what they found in the end, after a lot of head scratching, was that there was a background that was interfering with the measurement. So when you make these ratio measurements, you're essentially counting how many electron decays do you see and how many muon decays do you see? And it's, what had happened was that there was a, some backgrounds essentially involving hadronic decay. So this is decays where rather than producing two electrons, you produce two quarks. And they were getting misidentified as electrons in very rare, very rare occurrences. So essentially, th uh, this, this is a graph. This is actually how you sort of count the number of particles. This is a very, if you're a particle physicist, this is your bread and butter. It's an invariant mass plot. So this is showing the mass of the particle, the original particle, the beauty particle, essentially. And the signal is this peak. So this is that sort of, this is dotted line. So you see the data points. So this is the fit, essentially, all these different background components included. And what was found is that underneath this big peak from this, the electron signal, there was a little bump from this misidentified hadronic background, which essentially meant you were overcounting the number of electron decays. And this was a real disaster. So when you actually take this background into account, these ratios that I showed you all move back to one. So they now agree with the standard model. So we now no longer have any, any evidence of non-lepton universality. And this is very, very disappointing because the reason these ratios were particularly compelling is because there were ratios, all the theoretical uncertainties from QCD cancel out. So they're pristine observables in the sense that theory can predict their values very precisely. The, the observables that remain, the angular observables, the branching ratios are all subject to these uh, QCD uncertainties, which means they're much less, well, they're less uh, kind of convincing, I suppose. So we're, we're now left in this rather strange position. And these ratios, as I said, they generated a huge amount of theoretical excitement in the last decade or so. Now they've gone away, it seems. There's still some room. There could still be some non-electron universality here, but you know we'd have to measure them much more precisely now to see it. But we still have these anomalies in the branching ratios and the angular observables. And because these are uh, muonic decays, they're much easier to measure. So we're pretty confident we haven't cocked it up in the case of the muons. We're pretty sure that the measurements are right. The question there is, is the theory right? But there's still, you know, these, these anomalies are still there and they're still quite significant. So we're in this kind of, uh, you know, having had a big, big blow uh, back in December when we, when we found this result, uh, we're now back in a position of thinking, OK, we've really got to try and understand these other anomalies. And they're not the only ones in particle physics by any stretch. So there are actually anomalies uh, in measurements of muons themselves, something called muon G minus two which is measured by an experiment in America that is about four sigma from the standard model. Again, there though, could be the theory that's, that's confusing us. But there are, so there are a bunch of these effects and it's not clear what's gonna happen. So it could be that we are seeing the first hints of new physics, or it could be that we're gonna discover something about quantum chromodynamics that we didn't get before, which is, old, which is affecting these theoretical predictions. But I'll finish with a little bit of, uh, of optimism. So just at the same time that it was all going a bit pear-shaped, for these ratio anomalies. CMS, one of the, the big experiments that discovered the Higgs, published this plot. What this is, they, they essentially have done a search for leptoquarks because leptoquarks are being predicted by these new theory and explaining the anomalies. The general purpose experiments then started to try and find particular types of leptoquarks predicted by these models. Now, this plot essentially is showing you as a function of leptoquark mass, so how heavy is the leptoquark in GEV versus uh, the upper limit on how likely you are to produce a leptoquark. So if you collide two protons, you know, how likely is it you make one of these things? So likeliness goes up the way. Um, so what you essentially have here is what's called an exclusion plot. So this black line tells you that you can kind of exclude this region. So regions with uh, a mass in this region and a, and a kind of interact the production cross-section up here. 
And this is your expected limit. So this band is what you predict if there are no leptoquarks. And what you can see here is this black line, the observed limit, deviates from the predicted limit. So there's, a, there's an excess of events that look like leptoquarks at high masses. So it could be that we're seeing, and this is about a three sigma effect again. So it's evidence, but not convincing, not yet five sigma. This could be a hint of the underlying particle that is causing the other anomalies, or it could be nature being cruel to us again, just sort of tricking us. But, you know, so basically we're in this rather intriguing but uncertain position. It's not clear where this is going to go in the, the next few years. But if it does pan out, it, and it, it is new physics, it's going to tell us something really fundamental to do with the standard model itself. And it is worth appreciating that the standard model was first put, written down in, 19, in the 1970s. That's when it was kind of finally put into its finished form effectively. And there have been no major, there's been no major progress in fundamental high energy physics since then. And what this would be likely telling us, so A, discovering any new fundamental object would be a massive breakthrough, but it probably would be telling us something about the structure of the standard model itself. As I said, this mystery, why are there six quarks and six leptons? Why are there three generations of matter? And if that's true, then it's gonna be the beginning of a very exciting journey because it's unlikely that whatever cause is causing this anomaly is just one particle on its own. It's gonna be part of a much larger theory that contains many new particles and will tell us something about the fundamental ingredients of nature. So how are we going to figure this out? Well, for the last few years, LHCB has been undergoing a major upgrade. So the experiment is being, uh, has been upgraded to allow it to record data at five times its previous rate. And that will allow us to really you know, hone in on these ultra rare decays that we're studying, make much, much more precise measurements. So we're now taking data again with the new experiment and, and commissioning it. And soon we're going to start to get new results coming out. So the next few years are going to be really interesting. It's going to be exciting to see where all of this goes. Um, in the longer term, uh, the LHC itself is going to get a major upgrade. So there's a, an upgrade called High Luminosity LHC. Here's a picture of the construction site where they're digging new tunnels for this experiment. So essentially, it's going to be upgrading the focusing magnets of the collider, which basically means you can squeeze the proton beams to much smaller cross sections. And that means more collisions per second, because there's this law of diminishing returns of the experiments. The longer you run them, each year of new data is a smaller and smaller fraction of the data you've already recorded. So you want to increase the luminosity, increase the data rate as much as possible, and then you can really make very, very precise measurements and hopefully finally find the place where the standard model breaks down. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. I hope that's been interesting, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Cheers. Thank you, Dr. We'll just pass the mic around for questions. Yeah, well, they're the same thing. I mean, what, yeah, so general relativity says that all forms of mass, energy, pressure, etc., generate gravity. So the Higgs boat, you know, the Higgs field that gives particularly what it's responsible for is the rest mass of fundamental particles, but that's all. So the rest mass of the electron, the rest mass of the up and the down quark. But actually, if you notice in this table, the, the masses of these particles, so the mass of the up quark is 2.3 MeV, the mass of the down quark is 4.8 MeV, and the electron about half an MeV. So you add those up, you get something like 8 MeV. And then the mass of a proton is about 1 GeV. So 100 times heavier than its constituents. So most of the mass of ordinary bulk matter doesn't come from the Higgs, it comes from strong interaction. So most of the mass of the proton comes from the quarks and the gluons, well, sorry, the gluons really, the gluon field that binds them together. So even if you turn the Higgs field off, actually we still have particles in the universe, proton neutrons to be massive, but electrons wouldn't. So in that sense, yes, it's, it's contributing to gravity, but it has nothing to do with gravity as a force in the sense. You know, gravity is, as far as well, at least as we understand it classically, is the curvature of space time due to the presence of, of matter and energy, which the Higgs field is part of, but not, you know, is no different in that sense to any of the other fields. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, difference. Um, hi. Um, how would the uh, um like the improvement of being able to compute like the hadron effects um, improved by the effect of like um, working out theory um, based on the data. How would that help? 
is crucial, it's really crucial. And, that, and that's one of the things that, you know, there's a sort of, you know, there's a simplistic idea of how science works is you have a theory, you make a prediction, you do a measurement, you compare the two. But actually in practice, that step from having a theory to predicting something is usually very difficult. Um, you know, there's, there's actually, there's a great uh, interview with Feynman um, from the, I think it must've been in the six, maybe, maybe it's the 80s that had been recorded. So back then, quantum chromodynamics, the theory of the strong interaction had been discovered and people thought they had the right theory, but they didn't know because they couldn't calculate anything. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the technology, theoretical technology has advanced enormously. So people spend their entire careers effectively calculating, you know, a little contributions from quantum field theory to refine the prediction of some quantity. And because these measurements all involve quarks, they all involve QCD. So, um, yeah, it, and adva any advances in that direction are hugely, hugely useful. Interestingly, actually, there's been new progress in what's called lattice QCD, which is a, a way of count. You can't, the problem with QCD is you can't, it's non perturbative because it's a strong force. You can't break it up into perturbative expansion and just calculate like the simplest terms. You've got all these terms that all are large, and it's very hard to figure out which ones are important. So, lattice QCD is a clever way of solving this, of getting around this issue. Um, and there's new new predictions for these branching ratios that came out last year from the Glasgow group, which get improve the precision of these predictions, which actually make the anomalies bigger. So they get they go over four sigma in some cases now. So yeah, it's crucial. So you need both, but you need theory and experiment. They actually play off against each other. One of the things that you know, if all of this goes away and it's all just misunderstood experimental or, or theoretical effects, we'll have learned a huge amount about the theory of the strong interaction from the process of having to, well, I say we theorists will have learned a lot from this process and also discovered new productive forms of new physics models that no one has thought about before. But yeah, it's a crucial ingredient and the better the theorists do, the better we can do. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, so the mesh supersymmetry predicts a dark matter-like particle. Mm. Uh, obviously, you don't really have supersymmetry. Yeah. Um, so do any of these new theories predict similar particles or is it kind of more over the moment? So, well, um, I should first of all say supersymmetry is not dead. You can't really kill it because it, A, it could live at any scale. So supersymmetry is the key ingredient in string theory, for example. And string theory lives at the Planck scale. So it could be up on the Planck scale. It could be at the electroweak scale. It could be lower. Maybe we've missed it. Maybe it's sort of hidden. So, you know, people are still looking for supersymmetry at the LHC because, you know, there are lots of different ways of configuring supersymmetry, lots of different models that predict particles of different masses. So it could still be there. Broad, I think what the most people have sort of moved on to other things because, you know, it doesn't look so promising. I said that to start with. But in terms of the other new physics models, um, the leptocorp models, so these sort of more, these not grand unified, I don't know what you call them exactly, but sort of quark lepton unification models. As far as I know, they don't predict stable nuclear particles, but one of the things they do do is explain the hierarchy problem in some cases. So this, uh, this problem with the Higgs field that I discussed. So they, some, so they address more than one problem, but not as far as I know, not dark matter, although you can probably come up with some kind of a model where you link them together, I imagine. Um, the, uh, the Z prime models, there I'm not so sure because the Z prime models are more a bit more ad hoc. It's basically you add a new symmetry group, you get a new force particle as a result. Um, and it kind of there's many ways you can play with that. I mean, there's ideas that these like new forces could be mediators to a dark sector, for example. Um, but as far as I know, that's not a sort of major element of then they're more trying to address the anomalies we're seeing in B physics rather than you know questions like dark matter. Though, you know. If you if we did discover a new particle, a new force, it's quite likely it's going to tell us something about the dark sector ultimately, because it's going to be a kind of a key, a gateway into a new sector, which may well be connected. And we'll just have to wait and see what happens, I suppose. Yeah, I wanted to ask, do you think that this standard model might be incomplete simply for the aesthetic reason? That with the addition of the Higgs boson, now basically have a four by four and a one sort of on the edge. Yeah. Do you think there are three missing components? Yeah, I wouldn't take this too literally. This is just a sort of like convenient way of arranging the particles, but I mean. Um, there, there are sort of elements, there are symmetries in the standard model. So there's these six, well, there's the generations and there's the, there's the six quarks and the six leptons. The, there's a kind of a symmetry that relates, well, 
There's, there's a symmetry for the gluon. There are actually eight gluons that arise from this symmetry called SU3 symmetry. And then the W and the Z and the photon and the Higgs are all part of this SU2 cross, S, cross U1. If you do gauge field theory, you know what this means, but it's basically some uh, symmetry groups that generate these different forces. So you have these bits of symmetry that don't, they're a bit ad hoc looking, basically. So you've got a bunch of matter particles, which there's some suggestive patterns, don't really know where they're there, though. The forces each have symmetries that are associated with them, but we don't know why we have three different symmetries, SU3, SU2, and U1, sorry. Um, so like what, what grand unified theories did in the 80s, they usually had some bigger symmetry group like SO10 or SU5, um, which contain within them as subgroups these symmetries in the standard model. So they would explain you know, why you have electromagnetism weak and strong forces. They would also explain the quarks um, and the leptons usually. Um, and because they would be contained. And then they would have other bits of internal symmetries that would predict X and Y bosons and other forces and things that we haven't seen. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, as I said, this table doesn't really mean anything. It's just a way of arranging the particles. But there are symmetries here, and they are suggestive that they are sort of fragments of perhaps a bigger symmetry. That may not be true. And there's a kind of aesthetic desire that we, we would like that to be true. It'd be really nice if there was some profound, simple symmetry that gives us all this stuff. Doesn't, nature doesn't have to be that way. Nature could just be a bit ad hoc, perhaps. Um, but uh, but yeah, if, if we find a new force or you know, a new set of particles, they will probably be part of... It's a bit like you're seeing part of a puzzle. You're only seeing one corner of it, and you can't really see the full symmetrical pattern because you're only getting an edge of it. And that, that may be the position we're in, hopefully. Just to just... Um, it's just... It's just yeah. um, maybe for the top and... I've seen from somewhere that the current incarnation of it would be forced to explain the messy and genetic of asymmetry. Is that a thing? Yeah, well, okay. I mean, matter antimatter asymmetry. Um, Creating matter in the early universe over antimatter, there's there are these three conditions that have to be satisfied. They're called the Sakharov conditions after Andrei Sakharov, who's a Russian theoretical physicist of the mid-20th century. So basically, you need three things. You need uh, a process that can violate baryon number. So it's what's called a baryogenesis process. So it basically can make more protons than antiprotons. Um, the standard model does actually contain a process like this. It can't be done by any of the particles, but it can be done by these really weird things called sphalerons. Um, so a sphaleron is not a particle. It's essentially a kind of coherent uh, interaction of multiple gauge fields. So it's like having the W and the Z field and the photon field and the Higgs field all kind of vibrating together. They kind of, you know, so they were things that would have existed in a very early universe. They're not particles, as I said, they're kind of collective motion of quantum fields. And they're in the very early universe, they actually can create more quarks than antiquarks or more leptons than antileptons. So standard model contains that first condition. Then you need um, CP violation, so charge parity violation, which I think what you're alluding to, which is a combination of charge symmetry where you reflect all the particles' charges and parity symmetry, which is literally mirror reflection. So you reflect the laws of physics left to right, effectively. And we know that charge parity symmetry is violated in the standard model. So it's violated by beauty quark decays, actually. So we, you know, LHCB has discovered new types of CP violation in charm quarks and in beauty quarks, but it was discovered originally uh, in K-on decays back in the, God, I can't remember now, 70s or 80s, I can't, can't remember. So the sample also includes CP violation. The third condition is um, the universe in the early universe has to be out of thermal equilibrium. And the reason for that is if you have a process that can make more particles than antiparticles, you have this breaking of the symmetry. If you have thermal equilibrium, then the forward reaction runs the same space as the backward reaction. And so you don't have any change. So you need a, a non-equilibrium situation. In principle, the sample can do all of these things. But now that we know the mass of the Higgs boson, uh, and we've measured CP violation reasonably accurately, we know that these effects are not big enough in the standard model. So you get a small amount, a very, very small amount of baryogenesis, but nowhere near enough to create the preponderance of matter that we see in the universe. So um, that's why we're looking for new sources of CP violation, particularly. There's a whole program at LHCB, which is basically looking at CP violation and trying to measure it accurately. Again, still this kind of indirect method of, is there, if there's some new force that violates the symmetry much, in a much bigger way, in the standard model that we might it might show up in lower energy processes first, for example. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hello again. Thanks. <laughs> um, do you believe in a new theory or some 
kind of addition to the standard model. Do you believe we should be increasing or decreasing the amount of free, free parameters on that theory? God, I don't, I mean, believe is a very dangerous word in science, I think. I mean, I, I'm an experimental physicist. I don't really have an opinion. I mean, my, my, my job is to measure, try and measure nature as best we can, you know, and sort of actually see how things are in terms of, you know, preferences. I mean, I guess you might have an aesthetic preference for sort of smaller numbers of free parameters or more elegant symmetry groups, but nature doesn't have to conform to our prejudices. So I think the best, you know, the best we can do as an experimental scientist is try and leave any biases at home and just make the best measurement you can. I'm sorry, that's not a very interesting answer. But... Yeah, Jeff, <laughs> not in the cricket team. <laughs> Um, so in the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that there is a problem with heat expansion of the large hydrogen collider that we need to account for. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid that you said that it expands by 30 meters. Mm -hmm. And like, wouldn't that mean that the radius changes by a few meters by like five meters? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, it's, a, it's an impressive stat, but I guess you have to remember it's 30 meters over 27,000 meters. So it's only a smallish, you know, sub, sub percent effect. So it doesn't all shrink in the same in one place, it shrinks throughout the whole ring. So basically, the way this is accommodated is that you have these bellows like structures between the magnets, which are sort of flexible. So the joints basically can sort of slide over each other slightly, but they're only in each magnet interconnection. I'm not sure what the movement would be. You could probably work it out. We don't want to do maths quickly. I think there's something like 2,000 magnets. So there'll be 2,000 interconnections. You'll spread through 30 meters by 2,000 over 2,000 connections. So that tells you roughly, you know, how much flexing you're going to get in every joint. But yeah, I mean, the radius machine would also change very slightly. But so we we'll basically try to maintain the same radius by extending and contracting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like well, I suppose if you think about these kind of magnets, as sort of, if you think about those rigid metal bars, they might they shrink a bit and then these bellows like structures just accommodate for that so they kind of counterbalance the shrinkage effect the magnets are straight they're not um they're not curved so you have a series of straight sections essentially moved around the ring yeah. thank you yeah there are no more questions i think we can end the talk so thank you so much for the talk again and i think we should give uh, harry another round of applause thank you very much thank you. I forgot, I forgot to plug my book. So if you, if you enjoyed this talk and you'd like to know more, it's essentially about how we figured out